Hello there, it's Peter Mansbridge, host of The Bridge, where we reflect on the issues of the day and how they could impact you. Politics, public health, technology, they are just some of the topics you'll hear about. Cut through the clutter and tune into The Bridge, a Sirius XM podcast available everywhere. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. I feel like I should apologize for today's conversation in advance. Not because it's not informative or engaging or smart or funny. Our guest is all of those things. But because it's about one of the very few things that can freak just about anyone out. The mere thought of them has been spooking Toronto residents more than usual. A recent viral TikTok that purported to show a bed bug on the TTC hasn't helped ease the concern either. And experts say the critters are usually found in high traffic areas. Yeah. So bed bugs, they are all over Toronto and other cities. Seriously, if you ask an expert, they will say, quote, they're everywhere, end quote. Toronto is Canada's bed bug capital, but the rest of the country isn't safe either. And listen, I promise I'm not trying to freak you out. But also, bed bugs are getting harder to kill. Seriously, they're evolving. So how did we go from a few dozen reports per year of bed bugs around the turn of the past century to thousands or even tens of thousands of infestations a year in major cities today. Why are we so terrified of these bugs in particular? And what do you need to know about these creatures that we've been at war with for thousands of years, even if you really don't want to know it? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story, and yes, I'm sorry. Loren McKeon is a journalist and author and the deputy editor of Toronto Life, where uh, she wrote about bed bugs. Uh, If you're squeamish, this one might not be for you. Hello, Loren. Hello. Why don't you start, because uh, mistaken identity happens in this space, I gather. Um, How should people recognize a bed bug if they think they've seen one in their house or uh, famously while they're sitting on the TTC or something? Yes. And you're right. Mistaken identity does happen a lot because I think, you know, we're so freaked out about bugs in general um, that any bug sometimes can give us the ick and can have us, uh, you know, going into a panic. Bed bugs, I think, you know, they're noticeable by their resemblance to an apple seed. So Mm. a fully grown bed bug looks a little bit like an apple seed with legs. They are excellent at hiding, though. If you don't see a bed bug, the other telltale sign to look for in your home is to just get really gross right off the bat. (laughs) This whole thing's going to be a little gross, so we might as well get right into (laughs) it. Yeah, it's just going to be gross. That's right. You know, they eat blood and then they defecate the blood. So it looks like uh, little markings, black dots of dried blood. And that's often what people will see before they see the bug because the bug hides. It does not come out. Mm. Uh, When you see it in your home, that means you actually have a really bad infestation. Oh, good. Uh, So you're likely to see the signs of it first before you actually see the bug itself. Um, You mentioned people see any bug, these bugs or others, and immediately can kind of panic and lose it. Do you remember the first time uh, that you saw a bed bug in your apartment? What was that like? Yeah, I, mean, I wish I could forget seeing yeah, it. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but I not only can I see it, I can still, you know, feel it when we talk about it. I had just moved into a new place and, you know, I was so excited. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. It had lots of sunlight. It had recently sort of been redone. So like a new kitchen, new bathroom, that sort of stuff. And I had my lease had overlapped. So I had a really bad basement apartment before that I just wanted to get out of. So while I was packing it, uh, I got an air mattress Mm -hmm. and I brought my computer and my plants and my cat into the new place. It was totally empty. Then I was working on editing a story 
and I felt something on my arm. Oh, man. And I kind of looked down and there was a bug. And then I noticed there was one on my hand. I was sitting on my air mattress. There was one on the pillow. And then I I kind of looked up and it was like uh, this horde coming toward me of uh, bugs. Oh, my God. It was terrifying. It was horrifying. And I kind of immediately suspected a bed bug um, just because I had seen pictures of them before. It looked exactly like one. And also the the advancing of the army <laughs> kind of gave me a hint that that I was their meal that they were in search of. And you had just signed the lease on this place. I had just signed the lease. I was so happy to be there. And uh, then suddenly I was not happy at all. I I freaked out in a, in the most extreme dramatic way possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah, I panicked. I totally panicked. Absolutely. Can you describe, and I know every experience is going to be different, but I mean, describe, uh, I guess, briefly your experience dealing with what you had and and how kind of common that might be. It is pretty common. And I think having spoken to people and done a lot of research since, you know, of course, people freak out first. Yeah. In my case, you know, I killed all the bugs on me in my freak out, um, but then I realized that I didn't know absolutely for sure that it was a bed bug and I would have to show my landlord. So then I caught one, which I think is pretty common too. You want a sample to show pest control, to show your landlord to prove to yourself that you're not totally losing it. Uh, So I caught a couple in a Ziploc bag and stuffed it into my freezer. And that was at night. So, you know, I personally (laughs) began to look at every nook and cranny in my apartment to see if I could find more. And I think that's actually pretty common too, right? Right. I did all my laundry and then I called my landlord the next morning as soon as I could. Uh, I think I probably woke them up, (laughs) but he wasn't there. He was on vacation. So I got the building's acting superintendent who was, in my case, surprisingly chill about it. Mm -hmm. And I later learned that that was because they already knew that the unit had bed bugs. They just hadn't told me. Is that allowed? I know I'm jumping in here, but is that, is that allowed? I mean, I don't know, to be honest, but I do think it's pretty common that buildings do not disclose that they have a pest control problem or they've had an infestation maybe a year ago and you move in and they're not going to tell you. And in my case, you know, looking back on it, hindsight is twenty twenty. I feel kind of stupid about it now, but when I had gone to look at the unit, the superintendent was like, you know, they're they're in the process of moving. It's really packed. You know, you don't want to go in there. You can look at this other unit. And I was like, oh yeah, sure. I was so desperate to get out of my basement apartment (laughs) into this nice, so I thought, you know, building that I was like, yeah, no problem. Right. But I learned later it was because they had a bed bug problem and they didn't want me going into the unit and and seeing it. So, you know, in in my case, they were like, oh yeah, you know, we'll get someone to look at it in the next day or so. (laughs) And that just was not acceptable for me, and I decided to call my own pest control just because the thought of going back to sleep yeah. and knowing that I would become a feast again uh, was too much for me to handle. We will come back to your experience and, and how it ended. But first, more generally, because your piece looks at the whole context of bed bugs. How long have we been at war with these critters, at least as far back as we can tell? Yeah, I was surprised to learn that the answer is literally for thousands and thousands of years. Archaeologists have found evidence at sites that date back more than 3,000 years. And we know also that the Roman Empire first spread them as a result of the shipping trade. Wow. So, you know, it's almost as long as there have been humans and travel there have been bed bugs that, you know, come along for the ride that look for food. Mm-hmm. And people have always been freaked out about them too. It wasn't like, oh, you know, you know, modern times, we just can't handle them. We get the ick about them. You know, back in the day, they were so used to it. No, like people have always been freaked out about bed bugs. There's stories of, you know, burning down entire buildings, huh. of using very lethal methods that have killed people by accident just because people are so freaked out. They want them gone. They'll resort to anything, uh, whether it's poison, fire. It doesn't matter. People have hated them forever. Why do you think that is? I mean, we we obviously um, are bitten to death by mosquitoes every summer. Uh, people have ants in their homes. Is it because they get us like when we're sleeping? 
I think it is. And I and I do think there is something about a bed bug that gives us like the the biggest ick. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's the even when I talked to pest control experts, they said, you know, among them, traditionally, no one wants to deal with bed bugs. <laughs> it's like the it's the one that gives everyone the ick. Um, and I think it is because, you know, you're sleeping, you're at peace. And you're being fed on and they're sneaky. Not only do they eat you, they're really sneaky and they hide. And when they do come out, it's a sight to behold. It's yeah. very gross. You know, there's a lot of them. And it does feel like a little mini zombie attack in, in a way. So it is, uh, It is. yeah, there's something about them. I think that just the idea of having your home, which is your sanctuary, um, no longer be that is, is just too much to handle. One of the unfortunate reasons we're having this conversation now, though, is because for a time, at least, probably a very brief time, it did kind of seem like we were winning the war against bedbugs, right? And now they're back. Can you explain, first of all, how uh, we finally got ahead of them and, and then how we screwed it up or they evolved or whatever? Yeah, so I think a number of things have been happening and even experts can't pinpoint it to a single answer. But there are many factors, unfortunately, (laughs) that have led to the sort of modern resurgence of bedbugs. So, you know, as we sort of chatted about for centuries, people have been going to extreme methods (laughs) to get rid of bedbugs. And one of the things that they did was introduce DDT in the 1940s, which we now know to be an extremely toxic pesticide (laughs) that's been banned. But when they introduced it to the in the 1940s and before it got banned in the 60s and 70s, it really eradicated a lot of bugs, but particularly bed bugs. And people too, maybe. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's the downside of it, um, of course. But they began resurfacing in sort of the early 2000s when we see, you know, travel picking up. Mm. Bed bugs are also extremely resilient. You know, they adapted, they modified their exoskeleton changes, um, you know, their biology has changed. So like little mini Terminator 2s. Exactly. And places, Toronto in particular, but other places around the world just saw jumps from, you know, maybe a few cases a year to thousands of cases a year. And sort of by 2009, 2010, it had not quite hit what it's at right now, but it had exploded. You know, the crisis of bed bugs had exploded. And for a lot of people, it really seemed to come out of nowhere. People didn't know what they looked like. They didn't know what to look for. And in a lot of cases, that means they spread them. Bedbugs are also great travelers. So, you know, they hitch a ride whenever they can. And their only objective is to get a next blood meal. That's all they want. Other bugs, you know, ants build little cities. You can be fascinated even if you get the ick by other bugs. The only thing bed bugs want to do is eat us. Right. So they're everywhere and they just, um, they're tiny and they'll just hitch a ride in a backpack, on a pant leg, on a TTC seat, and a library book, you know, whatever it might be. And they're spreading and they're becoming extremely resilient. And that's sort of how we got to be where we are today. And even pesticides now, they're sort of evolving to be able to withstand those as well. So fun. Fun. (laughs) Very fun. Yeah, very fun. But it is really interesting. And we are going to talk about um, how we're trying to stay ahead of them and they're trying to stay ahead of us and all of that. But but first, sorry to everybody listening to this in the greater Toronto area, but apparently Toronto is Canada's bed bug capital. How do we know that? And and how are other cities in Canada doing? Is this unique to us? Are we just slightly ahead of the pack? Yeah, it's a bit of an unfair characterization. I mean, it's true, but it's a bit unfair, you know, because part of the reason why we're the bed buggiest city is just because we're the biggest and we experience the most travel and we have a housing crisis. Uh, One of the companies that I spoke to, Orkin Canada, who's the biggest pest control company in Canada, you know, they keep track of all of their cases and Toronto far and above has the most cases even adjusting for population. <laughs> so we just we just have a lot of cases. Right. But the reason for that, you know, is is people travel a lot here. We're big. And also, you know, housing does really contribute to it because a lot of people that are facing the crisis most head on are the people that are, you know, in vulnerable places where maybe their landlords are not taking care of an infestation, they're not properly addressing it, and it just spreads and spreads and spreads. 
Hello there, it's Peter Mansbridge, host of The Bridge, where we reflect on the issues of the day and how they could impact you. Politics, public health, technology, they are just some of the topics you'll hear about. Cut through the clutter and tune into The Bridge, a Sirius XM podcast available everywhere. What has Toronto done since this resurgence to try and uh, get these under control? And <laughs> has it succeeded? I guess not, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. But, you know, how has it worked? Yeah, when bedbugs first sort of reappeared um, in huge numbers in 2009, the city and also the province of Ontario were just as freaked out as the rest of us, you know, and they came together and sort of created a bed bug task force which involved people from public health, pest control companies, housing, social workers, you know, everyone that could possibly be facing the issue. And they tackled it head on. The government of Ontario funded the program and, you know, they increased uh, prevention efforts, uh, awareness efforts, funding to public housing to combat the problem. You know, it's, it's unlikely that it would have stopped the spread because the bugs, bed bugs are just uh, so good at what they do. But it might have slowed it down and might have kept it more manageable. Right. Uh, but it was expensive. And Ontario eventually stopped funding the program only a few years in. And, you know, essentially the city threw up its hands and... Uh, Said you're on your own. Yeah, <laughs> more or less. What do exterminators do um, when you're on your own and you see bed bugs and you call them in? Just walk us through kind of the current methods that they use. You know, there's sort of this assumption that the pest control companies can come in and just spray chemicals everywhere and then that's it. And that's how they get rid of them. And that's what I wanted. You know, I was like, when I called, I was like, give me the chemicals. I don't care. Yeah, give me <laughs> the DDT. Get rid of them. It doesn't matter. You know, people are desperate. But bedbugs are becoming increasingly resilient to them. So it's not just that we don't want to spray chemicals everywhere. It's also that it doesn't work just to spray chemicals everywhere. So a lot of what they do is chemicals, yes, but also uh, steam treatment, so mm -hmm. heat treatment. So at a very high temperature, bedbugs will be killed at all stages of life. So egg, adult, nymph, you know, all of it. Mm -hmm. And then also decluttering. They have nothing to do with the cleanliness of your home. That's not, they don't care about that. They just care about, you know, eating you. But decluttering can help because it gives them fewer places to hide. Right. And sometimes you need more than one treatment because the first one might get um, not all the bed bugs, not all the eggs, and they're, they're out and they reproduce very quickly. In my case, um, I, was, I say lucky with a laugh because I don't really think having bed bugs was lucky. But I was lucky in the sense that I hadn't moved in all my furniture. Mm. So it was very easy for the pest control company to figure out where they were hiding. Right. And, and that can be anywhere. Um, I remember I was like horrified when they checked my bathroom pipes. <laughs> I was just like, not surely, not in my sink. And they were like, anywhere. They will hide anywhere. anywhere. So your baseboards, you know, your bed cracks in the wall, seams in your cupboards, your pipes. If you have pictures hanging, they could hang in the picture frames. Like they'll, they'll check anywhere and they'll steam treat that. And then in my case, they did sort of a chemical spray along the baseboards because we didn't know where they were coming from. And my building manager didn't want to alert the other units or let us check them. Uh, so this was to keep it them from <laughs> advancing into my unit anymore. So, you know, once they hit the chemical spray, they would die. Huh. That came out of the baseboards and everything um, in search of me. But the protective coating spray worked and they, they didn't make it very far. So I was, you know, sweeping up bed bugs every morning, uh, monitoring my baseboards, jumping at every speck of lint. Sure. All of that. How much of that was complicated by the fact that you were in an apartment building and how hard is it to get them out of a shared space like that where you need to go into multiple places? It's incredibly hard. And I think, you know, most people cannot afford to pay for their own treatment if they're renting. It's expensive. It was about $1,000 and this was several years ago. I'm sure it's more expensive now. 
And I couldn't really afford it either, to be honest. I was just so, I felt trapped. You know, I had just signed my lease. I had nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to go into a bit of debt to, to get rid of the bugs. But it's tricky because, you know, when I spoke to my pest control, they were able to see that my place had been treated before, you know, they saw residue, they saw the bugs. Right. <laughs> um, they were able to tell that it had been treated. It just hadn't been treated. Maybe they, the building tried to treat it themselves. Uh, maybe it was sort of a mom and pop shop situation. You know, it wasn't well done, of course, because I, they were still there. Right. I argued for a long time with my building management and the building superintendent to post a notice to let the surrounding units know because mm -hmm. best practice treatment, of course, is to also treat surrounding units above, below, and beside because, you know, they're smart. They're sneaky. <laughs> they're going to keep going. You might carry them with you when you go to your laundry room, you know, if your building has a laundry room, all that sort of stuff. They said, absolutely not. And in my case, I, I wanted to try and recoup uh, some of the money that I had spent. I wanted them to reimburse me. And, you know, it was very heavily implied that if I started going around to telling people that there were bed bugs in the building, that I was not going to get that money back. Right. You know, I moved out of the building as soon as I could, but I was lucky they didn't come back into my unit. Do I think they were probably elsewhere in the building? Absolutely. Um, it seems very unlikely that it was just the previous tenant in my unit that had them. And certainly, I spoke to many other people for the story where they sort of describe, you know, if they have bad landlords, bad building management, it's like a weight in their building. They'll get it and maybe they'll treat their unit, but they won't treat the surrounding ones. And then in a few months, they'll hear someone three floors above them has bed bugs now. Hmm. And then maybe they'll treat that unit. And then they just move somewhere else. Right. You play whack-a-bug. Exactly. And it's, it's unfortunately very common for that to happen for a number of reasons. One, the tenant might wait to tell anyone or they might not want to let their neighbors know because there is so much stigma around it. You know, they don't want to get blamed. They don't want to be ostracized in their building. Right. Maybe they don't know their rights and they're afraid the landlord is going to blame them and try and boot them out. And then, you know, the landlords themselves... A lot of the times it's cost, you know, it costs a lot of money to treat a whole building mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe they're looking to cut costs, but in the end, it's just, you know, they just never get rid of the bug. Lastly, let's talk about where the fight goes from here, because I know um, you also visited, I guess, what do we call it? A lab, a facility a where <laughs> a farm where exterminators are trying to get on top of this as the bed bugs are evolving. So uh, tell us about that arms race. What's it like? What are they doing there? You know, Orkin Canada, as I said, is one of the biggest pest control companies in Canada. And, you know, because of that, they're able to sort of be at the forefront of research as well. And, you know, fortunately or unfortunately for them, I guess, depending on how you look at it, a lot of people send them samples. Mm -hmm. So they have a bed duck farm, but also a wider lab where they test, you know, to see maybe someone found something in their stew that they bought <laughs> from a grocery store or something, oh my God. which was the case when I actually went there that day. It turned out not to be a bug, but they thought it might have been a worm. <laughs> they were, you know, testing to see what it was. But they also have a, sort of a bed bug colony. It's multi-purpose. <laughs> so they use it to train their bed bug sniffing dogs, which mm. is another way to detect big infestations, say in university dorms or office buildings or larger apartment buildings. But they also use them for education. So when you ask about, you know, what's next, a huge part of it is actually teaching people what to look for. Right. Like what bed bugs actually look like, sort of the telltale signs that there's an infestation. Um, so that's part of it. And then the other thing they do is test ways of killing the bug. <laughs> so, you know, new pesticides, right. anything new on the market, they test to find out sometimes before it goes on the market, how effective it is. You know, there's a lot of bogus stuff on the market because people are so freaked out. They're willing to try anything, whether it's like an essential oil or, you know, maybe an over-the-counter spray that actually isn't high in a concentration of chemicals. Right. And then they test new products as well. And one of the new products that they're testing is called Apprehend. It's a biopesticide that's composed of like fungal spores. And it basically 
colonizes the insides of the bed bug and then kills it. Huh. So, you know, stuff like that gives me hope Mm -hmm. that, you know, we are developing maybe just as fast as the bed bugs or, you know, we're keeping up. Last thing, and I don't imagine there are many people still listening who uh, don't know if they have bed bugs by now after this discussion, but (laughs) is there a checklist you can give people? Let's say someone comes home or you wake up in the morning and you see one of these bugs and you look at it and it's like we discussed, it looks like a bed bug, like an apple seed. What do you do then? I was going to say, freak out. No. Run. (laughs) Run. What you do, if you see something like a bed bug itself, or if you see maybe, you know, black dotting on your mattress or on your baseboards, I think the first thing to do is just to call a pest control company. Right. There are some things that you can do on your own. And, you know, certainly after this article came out, we heard from a few people that were able to eradicate it on their own. But... That would not be a risk game <laughs> that I would want to play. I don't like those odds. And, you know, the reason for that is that they they do hide everywhere. You might not see them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you might steam clean yourself. I know I certainly did. But a lot of at-home steamers don't reach the temperatures high enough to kill them. And then a lot of over-the-counter bed bug pesticide sprays that you might find at, you know, Home Depot or something like that. The chemicals aren't in high enough concentrations to kill the bugs. They might kill it, the bugs that you see on contact, but they're not going to kill the eggs, the ones that are hiding. And a lot of times what you're doing is just giving resilience, like letting them build up uh, resilience to the spray that you're using. So I think the best thing to do is call a pest control company. Other things that you can do, you know, to help, are to, you know, clear everything away from your baseboard so that they can inspect it easily to see if you just maybe brought one home from somewhere, but they haven't infested yet, or if there is an infestation that you can't see. Right. Like if they're on your clothes and you see them on your clothes, high heat will do it. So if you wash your clothes and then put them really high heat in the dryer, that'll kill anything that's on your clothes. But I would put the effort into preventing. And then once you have an infestation, it's just time to call the experts. They can just look like they're gone and then come back for months and months and months. And I think the battle is not is not one that you want to have. Lauren, thank you so much for this. It was a fascinating, icky and funny <laughs> discussion, but I appreciate you sharing it with us. I'm sure a lot of people didn't make it to the end, but if they did, it was really useful. I understand if they didn't. <laughs> thank you for having me. Lauren McKeon, Deputy Editor of Toronto Life, Thoroughly nice person. Thoroughly creepy interview. Thank you, Loren. That was The Big Story. For more from us, of course, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can also send us any piece of feedback you have, an episode suggestion, something we might have missed, something you just want to say thanks for. Speaking of thanks, I am thankful for being out of here for the next week on a well-deserved vacation Your guest host, in my absence, will be the amazing Melissa Duggan, a reporter from City News. You can find The Big Story in every single podcast player, and of course, you can ask for it on your smart speaker by telling it to play The Big Story podcast. Which I suppose is telling more than asking. But the message still stands. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. I'll be back on March 11th. Hello there, it's Peter Mansbridge, host of The Bridge, where we reflect on the issues of the day and how they could impact you. Politics, public health, technology, they are just some of the topics you'll hear about. Cut through the clutter and tune into The Bridge, a Sirius XM podcast available everywhere.